Chapter 4 The next day, Friday, I came to find outside my door a Grand Lux Charles and Company basket with her card, Miss Holiday Go Lightly, traveling, and scribbled on the back in a freakishly awkward kindergarten hand, Bless you, darling Fred. Please forgive the other night. You were an angel about the whole thing. Mill Tendris. Holly, P.S. I won't bother you again. I replied, please do, and left this note at her door with what I could afford, a bunch of street vendor violets. But apparently she'd meant what she said. I neither saw nor heard from her, and I gathered she'd gone so far as to obtain a downstairs key. At any rate, she no longer rang my bell. I missed that. And as the days merged, I began to feel toward her certain far-fetched resentments, as if I were being neglected by my closest friend. A disquieting loneliness came into my life, but it induced no hunger for friends of longer acquaintance. They seem now like a salt-free, sugarless diet. By Wednesday, thoughts of Holly, of Sing Sing, and Sally Tomato, of worlds where men forked over $50 for the powder room, were so constant that I couldn't work. That night, I left a message in her mailbox. Tomorrow is Thursday. The next morning rewarded me with a second note in the playpen script. Bless you for reminding me. Can you stop for a drink tonight, six-ish? I waited until ten past six, then made myself delay five minutes more. A creature answered the door. He smelled of cigar and niz cologne. His shoes sported elevated heels. Without these added inches, one might have taken him for a little person. His bald, freckled head was dwarf big. Attached to it were a pair of pointed, truly elfin ears. He had Peking Gee's eyes, unpitying and slightly bulged. Tufts of hair sprouted from his ears, from his nose. His jowls were gray with afternoon beard and his handshake almost furry. Kids in the shower, he said, motioning a cigar toward the sound of water hissing in another room. The room in which we stood, we were standing, because there was nothing to sit on, seems as though it were being just moved into. You expected to smell wet paint. Suitcases and unpacked crates were the only furniture. The crates served as tables. One supported the mixings of a martini. Another a lamp, a liberty phone, Holly's red cat, and a bowl of yellow roses. Bookcases covering one wall boasted a half shelf of literature. I warmed to the room at once. I liked its fly-by-night look. The man cleared his throat. You expected? He found my nod uncertain. His cold eyes operated on me made neat, exploratory incisions. A lot of characters come here. They're not expected. You know the Kid Long? Not very. So you don't know the Kid Long? Well, I live upstairs. The answer seemed to explain enough to relax him. You got the same layout? Mm, That's smaller. He tapped ash on the floor. It's a dump. It's unbelievable. But the kid don't know how to live, even when she's got the dough. His speech had a jerky metallic rhythm, like a teletype. So, he said, What do you think? Is she or ain't she? Ain't she what? A phony. Well, I wouldn't have thought so. You're wrong. She is a phony. But on the other hand, you're right. She isn't a phony. Because she's a real phony. 
She believes all this crap she believes. You can't talk her out of it. I've tried with tears running down my cheeks. Benny Pollen respected everywhere. Benny Pollen tried. Benny had it on his mind to marry her. She didn't go for it. Benny spent maybe thousands sending her to head shrinkers, even the famous ones. The one can only speak German. Boy, did he throw in the towel. You can't talk her out of these. He made a fist, as though to crush an intangible. Ideas. Try it sometime. Get her to tell you some of the stuff she believes, mind you, he said. I like the kid. Everybody does. But there's lots that don't. I do. I sincerely like the kid. I'm sensitive, that's why. You gotta be sensitive to appreciate her. A streak of the poet. But I'll tell you the truth. You can beat your brains out for her, and she'll hand your horse shit on a platter. To give an example, who is she like you see her today? She's strictly a girl you'll read where she ends up at the bottom of a bottle of seconals. I've seen it happen more times than you've got toes. And those kids, they weren't even nuts. She's nuts. But young, and with a great deal of youth ahead of her. If you mean future, you're wrong again. Now, a couple of years back out on the coast, there was a time it could have been different. She had something working for her. She had them interested. She could have really rolled. But when you walk out on a thing like that, you don't walk back. Ask Louise Reiner. And Reiner was a star. Sure, Holly was no star. She never got out of the still department. But that was before the story of Dr. Wassel. Then she could have really rolled. I know, see, because I'm the guy was giving her the push. He pointed his cigar at himself. O.J. Berman. He expected recognition. And I didn't mind obliging him. It was all right by me. Except... I'd never heard of O.J. Berman. It developed that he was a Hollywood actor's agent. On the first one, saw her, out in Sad on Nita, singing around the track every day. I'm interested professionally. I find out she's some jock's regular. I uh, get the jock told, drop it, if you don't want conversation with the vice boys. See, the kid's 15. But stylish, she's okay, she comes across. Even when she's wearing glasses this thick, even when she opens her mouth and you don't know if she's a hillbilly or an oaky or what. I still don't. My guess is nobody will ever know where she came from. Such a goddamn liar. Maybe she don't know herself anymore. But it took us a year to smooth out that accent. How we did it finally, we gave her French lessons. After she could imitate French, it wasn't so long she could imitate English. We modeled her along the Margaret Sullivan type. But she could pitch some curves of her own. People were interested. Big ones. And to top it all, Benny Pollen, A respected guy. Benny wants to marry her. An agent could ask for more. Then wham! The story of Dr. Wassell. You see the picture? Cecil B. DeMille. Gary Cooper. Jesus. I kill myself. It's all set. They're going to test her for the part of Dr. Wessel's nurse. One of his nurses anyway. Then wham, the phone rings. He picked a telephone out of the air and held it to his ear. She says, this is Holly. I say, honey, you sound far away. She says, I'm in New York. I say, what the hell are you doing in New York when it's Sunday? And you got the test tomorrow? She says, I'm in New York because I've been to New York. I say, get your ass on a plane and get back here. She says, I don't want it. I say, what's your angle, doll? She says, you got to want it to be good, and I don't want it. I say, well, what the hell do you want? She says, when I find out, you'll be the first to know. See what I mean? Horse shit on a platter. The red cat jumped off its crate and rubbed against his leg. He lifted the cat on the toe of his shoe and gave him a toss, which was hateful of him. Except he seemed not aware of the cat, but merely his own irritableness. This is what she means, he said, flinging out his arms. A lot of characters. They aren't expected. Living off tips. Running around with bums. So maybe she could marry Rusty Trawler. You should pin a medal on her for that. He waited, glaring. 
Sorry. I don't know him. You know, Rusty Trowler, you can't know much about the kid. Bad deal, he said, his tongue clucking in his huge head. I was hoping you maybe had influence. Could level with the kid before it's too late. But according to you, it already is. He blew a smoke ring, let it fade before he smiled. The smile alerted his face, made something gentle happen. I could get it rolling again, like I told you, he said, and now it sounded true. I sincerely like the kid. What scandals are you spreading, O.J.? Holly splashed into the room, a towel more or less wrapped round her and her wet feet dripping footmarks on the floor. Just the usual, that you're nuts. The friend knows that already. But you don't. Light me a cigarette, darling, she said, snatching off a bathing cap and shaking her hair. I don't mean you, O.J., you're such a slob. You always nigglip. She scooped up the cat and swung him onto her shoulder. He perched there with the balance of a bird, his paws tangled in her hair as if it were knitting yarn. And yet, despite these amiable antics, it was a grim cat with a pirate's cutthroat face. One eye was gluey blind, the other sparkled with dark deeds. O.J. is a slob, she told me, taking the cigarette I'd lighted. But he does know a terrific lot of phone numbers. What's David O. Selznick's number, O.J.? Lay off. It's not a joke, darling. I want you to call him up and tell him what a genius Fred is. He's written barrels of the most marvelous stories. Well, don't blush, Fred. You didn't say you were a genius. I did. Come on, O.J., what are you going to do to make Fred rich? Suppose you let me settle that with Fred. Remember, she said, leaving us, I'm his agent. Another thing, if I holler, come zipper me up. And if anybody knocks, let him in. A multitude did. Within the next quarter hour, a stag party had taken over the apartment, several of them in uniform. I counted two naval officers and an Air Force colonel but they were outnumbered by graying arrivals beyond draft status. Except for a lack of youth, the guests had no common theme. They seemed strangers among strangers. Indeed, each face on entering had struggled to conceal dismay at seeing others there. It was as if the hostess had distributed her invitation while zigzagging through various bars, which was probably the case. After the initial frowns, however, they mixed without grumbling, especially O.J. Berman, who avidly exploited the new company to avoid discussing my Hollywood future. I was left abandoned by the bookshelves. Of the books there, more than half were about horses, the rest baseball. Pretending an interest in horse flesh and how to tell it gave me sufficiently private opportunity for sizing Holly's friends. Presently, one of these became prominent. He was a middle-aged child that had never shed its baby fat. Though some gifted tailor had almost succeeded in camouflaging his plump and spankable bottom, there wasn't a suspicion of bone in his body, his face a zero filled in with pretty miniature features, had an unused, uh, virginal quality. It was as if he'd been born, then expanded, his skin remaining unlined as a blow-up balloon. And his mouth, though ready for squalls and tantrums, a spoiled sweet puckering. But it was not appearance that singled him out. Preserved infants aren't all that rare. It was rather his conduct, for he was behaving as though the party were his. Like an energetic octopus, he was shaking martinis, making introductions, manipulating the phonograph. In fairness, most of his activities were dictated by the hostess herself. Rusty, would you mind? Rusty, would you please? If he was in love with her, then clearly he had his jealousy in check. A jealous man might have lost control, watching her as she skimmed around the room carrying her cat in one hand but leaving the other free to straighten a tie 
or remove lapel lint. The Air Force Colonel wore a medal that came in for quite a polish. The man's name was Rutherford Rusty Trawler. In 1908, he'd lost both his parents, his father the victim of an anarchist and his mother of shock, which double misfortune had made Rusty an orphan, a millionaire, and a celebrity, all at the age of five. He'd been a standby of the Sunday supplements ever since, a consequence that had gathered hurricane momentum when, still a schoolboy, he had caused his godfather custodian to be arrested on charges of sodomy. After that, marriage and divorce sustained his place in the tabloid sun. His first wife had taken herself and her alimony to a rival of Father Divine's. The second wife seemed unaccounted for, but the third had sued him in New York State with a full satchel of the kind of testimony that entails. He himself divorced the last Mrs. Trawler. His principal complaint stating that she'd started a mutiny aboard his yacht, said mutiny resulting in his being deposited on the dry Tortugas. Though he'd been a bachelor since, apparently before the war he'd proposed to Unity Mitford. At least he was supposed to have sent her a cable offering to marry her if Hitler didn't. This was sad to be the reason Winchell always referred to him as a Nazi. That and the fact that he attended rallies in Yorkville. I was not told these things. I read them in the Baseball Guide, another selection off Holly's shelf, which he seemed to use for a scrapbook. Tucked between the pages were Sunday features, together with scissored snippings from gossip columns. Rusty Trawler and Holly Go Lightly. Two on the aisle at One Touch of Venus Preem. Holly came up from behind and caught me reading Miss Holiday Go Lightly of the Boston Go Lightly's making every day a holiday for the 24 karat Rusty Trawler. Admiring my publicity or are you just a baseball fan? She said, adjusting her dark glasses as she glanced over my shoulder. I said, what was this week's weather report? She winked at me, but it was humorless. A wink of warning. I'm all for horses, but I loathe baseball. She said, and the sub message in her voice was saying she wished me to forget she'd ever mentioned Sally Tomato. I hate the sound of it on the radio, but I have to listen. It's part of my research. There's so few things men can talk about. If a man doesn't like baseball, then he must like horses. And if he doesn't like either of them, well, I'm in trouble anyway. He don't like girls. And how are you making out with O.J.? We've separated by mutual agreement. He's an opportunity, believe me. I do believe you. But what have I to offer that would strike him as an opportunity? She persisted. Go over there and make him think he isn't funny looking. He can really help you, Fred. I understand you weren't too appreciative, she seemed puzzled until I said... The story of Dr. Wessel. He's still harping, she said, and cast across the room an affectionate look at Berman. But he's got a point. I should feel guilty, not because they would have given me the part or because I would have been good. They wouldn't and I wouldn't. If I do feel guilty, I guess it's because I let him go on dreaming when I wasn't dreaming a bit. I was just vamping for time to make a few self-improvements. I knew damn well I'd never be a movie star. It's too hard. And if you're intelligent, it's too embarrassing. My complexes aren't inferior enough. Being a movie star and having a big fat ego are supposed to go hand in hand, actually. It's essential not to have any ego at all. I don't mean I'd mind being rich and famous. That's very much on my schedule, and someday I'll try to get around to it. But if it happens, I'd like to have my ego tagging along. I want to still be me when I wake up one fine morning and have breakfast at Tiffany's. 
You need a glass, she said, noticing my empty hands. Rusty, will you bring my friend a drink? She was still hugging the cat. Poor slob, she said, tickling his head. Poor slob without a name. It's a little inconvenient, his not having a name. But I haven't any right to give him one. He'll have to wait until he belongs to somebody. We just sort of took up by the river one day. We don't belong to each other. He's an independent and so am I. I don't want to own anything until I know. I found the place where me and things belong together. I'm not quite sure where that just is yet, but I know what it's like. She smiled and let the cat drop to the floor. It's like Tiffany's, she said. Not that I gave a hoot about jewelry, diamonds, yes, but it's tacky to wear diamonds before you're 40, and even that's risky. They say only look right on the really old girls, Maria Auspinskaya, wrinkles and bones, white hair and diamonds. I can't wait. But that's not why I'm mad about Tiffany's. Listen, you know those days when you've got the mean reds? Same as the blues? No, she said suddenly. No, the blues are because you're getting fat or maybe it's been raining too long. You're sad and that's all. But the mean reds are horrible. You're afraid and you sweat like hell. But you don't know what you're afraid of, except something bad is going to happen, only you don't know what it is. You've had that feeling? Quite often, some people call it yangst. All right, yangst. But what do you do about it? Well, a drink helps. I've tried that. I've tried aspirin, too. Rusty thinks I should smoke marijuana. And I did for a while, but it only makes me giggle. What I found out does the most good is just to get into a taxi and go to Tiffany's. It calms me down right away. The quietness and the proud look of it. Nothing very bad could happen to you there. Not with those kind men in their nice suits and that lovely smell of silver and alligator wallets. If I could find a real-life place that made me feel like Tiffany's, then I'd buy some furniture and give the cat a name. I thought maybe after the war, Fred and I... She pushed up her dark glasses and her eyes, the differing colors of them, the grays and wisps of blue and green, had taken on a far-seeing sharpness. I went to Mexico once. It's a wonderful country for raising horses. I saw one place near the sea. Fred's good with horses. Rusty Trowler came carrying a martini. He handed it over without looking at me. I'm hungry, he announced, and his voice, retarded as the rest of him, produced an unnerving brat wine that seemed to blame Holly. It's 7.30 and I'm hungry. You know what the doctor said? Yes, Rocky. I know what the doctor said. Well, then, break it up. Let's go. I want you to behave, Rusty. She spoke swiftly, but there was a governess threat of punishment in her tone that caused an odd flesh of pleasure, of gratitude, to pink his face. You don't love me, he complained, as though they were alone. Nobody loves naughtiness. Obviously, she'd said what he wanted to hear. It appeared to both excite and relax him. Still, he continued, as though it were a ritual. Do you love me? She patted him. Tend to your chores, Rusty, and when I'm ready, we'll go eat wherever you want. Chinatown? But that doesn't mean sweet and sour spare ribs. You know what the doctor said. As he returned to his duties with a satisfied waddle, I couldn't resist reminding her that she hadn't answered his question, do you love him? I told you I do. You could make yourself love anybody. Besides, 
He had a stinking childhood. If it was so stinking, why does he cling to it? Use your head. Can't you see it's just that Rusty feels safer in diapers than he would in a skirt, which is really the choice, only he's awfully touchy about it. He tried to stab me with a butter knife because I told him to grow up and face the issue and settle down and play house with a nice fatherly truck driver. Meantime, I've got him on my hands, which is okay. He's harmless. He thinks girls are dolls, literally. Thank God. Well, for a tour of most men, I hardly be thanking God. I meant thank God you're not going to marry Mr. Trawler. She lifted an eyebrow. By the way, I'm not pretending I don't know he's rich. Even land in Mexico costs something. Now, she said, motioning me forward, let's get hold of O.J. I held back while my hand worked to win a postponement. Then I remembered, why traveling? On my card, she said, disconcerted, you think it's funny? Not funny, just provocative. She shrugged. After all, how do I know where I'll be living tomorrow? So I told them to put traveling. Anyway, it was a waste of money ordering those cards, except I felt I owed it to them to buy some little something. They're from Tiffany's. She reached out for my martini. I hadn't touched it. She drained it in two swallows. And took my hand. Quit stalling. You're going to make friends with O.J. An occurrence at the door intervened. It was a young woman, and she entered like a windrush, a squall of scarves and jangling gold. Ha 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 holly, she said, wagging a finger as she advanced. You miserable hoarder, hogging all these simply riveting men. She was well over six feet taller than most men there. They straightened their spines, sucked in their stomachs. There was a general contest to match her swaying height. Holly said, What are you doing here? And her lips were taut as drawn string. Why, n -n nothing, sugar. I've been upstairs working with Uniyoshi. Christmas stuff for the Babazar. But you sound vexed, sugar, she scattered a roundabout smile. You but boys not vexed at me for butting in on your p -p party. Rusty Trawler tittered. He squeezed her out as though to admire her muscle and asked her if she could use a drink. I surely could, she said, make mine bourbon. Holly told her, there isn't any. Whereupon the Air Force Colonel suggested he run out for a bottle. Oh, I declare, don't let's have a f -f fuss. I'm happy with ammonia. Holly, honey, she said, slightly shoving her. Don't you bother about me. I can introduce myself. She stooped toward O.J. Berman, who, like many short men in the presence of tall women, had an inspiring mist in his eye. I'm Mag w -w Wildwood from Wildwood, Arkansas. That's hell country. It seemed a dance, Berman performing some fancy footwork to prevent his rivals cutting in. He lost her to a quadrille of partners who gobbled up her stammered jokes like popcorn tossed to pigeons. It was a comprehensive success. She was a triumph over ugliness, so often more beguiling than real beauty. If only because it contains paradox. In this case, as opposed to the scrupulous method of playing good taste and scientific grooming, the trick had been worked by exaggerating defects. She made them ornamental by admitting them boldly. Heels that emphasized her height so steep her ankles trembled. A flat, tight bodice that indicated she can go to a beach in bathing trunks. Her hair that was pulled straight back, accentuating the spareness, the starvation of her fashion model face. Even the strutter, certainly genuine, but still a bit laid on, had been turned to advantage. It was the master stroke, the stutter, for it contrived to make her 
banalities somehow original. And secondly, despite her tallness, her assurance, it served to inspire in male listeners a protective feeling. To illustrate, Berman had to be pounded on the back because she said, Who can tell me where is the John? Then, completing the cycle, he offered an arm to guide her himself. That, said Holly, won't be necessary. She's been here before. She knows where it is. She was emptying ashtrays, and after Mad Wildwood had left the room, she emptied another, and then said, sighed rather, It's really very sad. She had paused long enough to calculate the number of inquiring expressions. It was so sufficient and so mysterious, you'd think it would show more. But heaven knows she looks healthy, so well, clean. That's the extraordinary part, wouldn't you? She asked with concern, but of no one in particular. Wouldn't you say she looked clean? Someone coughed. Several swallowed. A naval officer who had been holding Med Wildwood's drink put it down. But then, said Hiley, I hear so many of these southern girls have the same trouble. She shuddered delicately and went to the kitchen for more ice. Mag Wildwood couldn't understand it. The abrupt absence of warmth on her return. The conversation she began behaved like green logs. They fumed, but would not fire. More unforgivably, people were leaving without taking her telephone number. The Air Force colonel decamped while her back was turned, and this was the straw too much. He asked her to dinner. Suddenly, she was blind, and since gin to artifice bears the same relation as tears to mascara, her attractions at once dissembled. She took it out on everyone. She called her hostess a Hollywood degenerate. She invited a man in his fifties to fight. She told Berman Hitler was right. She exhilarated Rusty Trawler by stiff-arming him into a corner. You know what's going to happen to you, she said, with no hint of a stutter. I was going to match you over to the zoo and feed you to the yak. He looked altogether willing, but she disappointed him by sliding to the floor where she sat humming. You're a bore. Get up from there, Holly said, stretching on a pair of gloves. The remnants of the party were waiting at the door. And when the boar didn't budge, Holly cast me an apologetic glance. Be an angel, would you, Fred? Put her in a taxi. She lives at the Winslow. Don't. Live Barbizon, region 45700. Ask for Mag Wildwood. You are an angel, Fred. They were gone. The prospect of steering an Amazon into a taxi obliterated whatever resentment I felt. But she solved the problem herself. Rising on her own steam, she stared down at me with a lurching loftiness. She said, Let's go, Stork. Catch Lucky Balloon. And fell full length, like an axed oak. My first thought was to run for a doctor. But examination proved her pulse fine and her breathing regular. She was simply asleep. After finding a pillow for her head, I left her to enjoy it. Chapter 5 The following afternoon, I collided with Holly on the stairs. You, she said, hurrying past with a package from the druggist. There she is, on the verge of pneumonia, a hangover out there, and the mean reds on top of it. I gathered from this that Mag Wildwood was still in the apartment, 
but she gave me no chance to explore her surprising sympathy. Over the weekend, mystery deepened. First, there was the Latin who came to my door, mistakenly, for he was inquiring after Miss Wildwood. It took a while to correct his error. Our accents seemed mutually incoherent. But by the time we had, I was charmed. He put together with care his brown head and bullfighter's figure had an exactness, a perfection, like an apple, an orange. Something nature has made just right. Added to this as decoration were an English suit and a brisk cologne and, what is still more on Latin, a bashful manner. The second event of the day involved him again. It was toward evening, and I saw him on my way out to dinner. He was arriving in a taxi. The driver helped him totter into the house with a load of suitcases. That gave me something to chew on. By Sunday, my jaws were quite tired. Then the picture became both darker and clearer. Sunday was an Indian summer day. The sun was strong, my window was open, and I heard voices on the fire escape. Holly and Mag were sprawled there on a blanket, the cat between them. Their hair, newly washed, hung lankly. They were busy, Holly varnishing her toenails, Mag knitting on a sweater. Mag was speaking. If you ask me, I think you're l -l -l lucky. At least there's one thing you can say for Rusty. He's an American. Bully for him. Sugar, there's a war on. And when it's over, you've seen the last of me, boy. I don't feel that way. I'm p -p -p proud of my country. The men in my family were great soldiers. There's a statue of Papa Daddy Wildwood smack in the center of Wildwood. Fred's a soldier, said Holly. But I doubt if he'll ever be a statue. Could be. They say the more stupid you are, the braver. He's pretty stupid. Fred? That boy upstairs? I didn't realize he was a soldier, but he does look stupid. Yearning, not stupid. He wants awfully to be on the inside staring out. Anybody with their nose pressed against a glass is liable to look stupid. Anyhow, he's a different Fred. Fred's my brother. You call your own f f flesh and b blood stupid? If he is, he is. Well, it's poor taste to say so. A boy that's fighting for you and me and all of us. What is this, a bond rally? I just want you to know where I stand. I appreciate a joke, but underneath, I'm a serious person. Proud to be an American. And that's why I'm sorry about Jose. She put down her knitting needles. You do think he's terribly good looking, don't you? Holly said, hmm, and swiped the cat's whiskers with her liqueur brush. If only I could get used to the idea of m m m marrying a Brazilian and b being a b Brazilian myself. It's such a canyon to cross. 6,000 miles and not knowing the language. Go to Berlitz! Why on earth would they be teaching p -p -p Portuguese? It isn't as though anyone spoke it. No, my only chance is to try and make Jose forget politics and become an American. It's such a useless thing for a man to want to be the p -p president of Brazil. She sighed and picked up her knitting. I must be madly in love. You saw us together. Do you think I'm madly in love? Well, does he bite? Meg dropped a stitch. Bite? You, in bed. Why no, should he? Then she added censoriously. But he does laugh. Good. That's the right spirit. I like a man who sees the humor. Most of them, they're all pant and puff. Meg withdrew her complaint. She accepted the comment as flattery reflecting on herself. 
Yes, I suppose. Okay, he doesn't bite. He laughs. What else? Mag counted up her drop stitch and began again. Knit, pearl, pearl. I said, I heard you. And it isn't that I don't want to tell you, but it's so difficult to remember. I don't d d dwell on these things the way you seem to. They go out of my head like a dream. I'm sure that's the n n n normal attitude. It may be normal, darling, but I'd rather be natural. Holly paused in the process of reddening the rest of the cat's whiskers. Listen, if you can't remember, try leaving the lights on. Please understand me, Holly. I'm a very, very, very conventional person. Oh, balls. What's wrong with a decent look at a guy you like? Men are beautiful. A lot of them are. Jose is. And if you don't even want to look at him, well, I'd say he's getting a pretty cold plate of macaroni. Lower your voice. You can't possibly be in love with him. Now, does that answer your question? No, because I'm not a cold plate of mama macaroni. I'm a warm-hearted person. It's the basis of my character. Okay, you've got a warm heart. But if I were a man on my way to bed, I'd rather take a long, a hot water bottle. It's more tangible. You won't hear any squawks out of Jose, she said complacently, her needles flashing in the sunlight. What's more, I am in love with him. You realize I've knitted ten pairs of argyles in less than three months, and this is the second sweater? She stretched the sweater and tossed it aside. What's the point, though? Sweaters in Brazil. I ought to be making sun helmets. Holly lay back and yawned. It must be winter sometime. It rains, that I know. Heat, rain, j -j -j jungles. Heat, jungles. Actually, I'd like that. Better you than me. Yes, said Holly with a sleepiness that was not sleepy. Better me than you.